Welcome everyone. I'm very happy to welcome my guest, Joan Lyons. Uh, she's joining me from her studio in Rochester, New York today. Joan Lyons has worked in a broad range of media over more than six decades, including and often combining printmaking, photography, drawing and painting, and has produced over 40 editioned artist books. Joan's work is held in major museum collections across the United States and has been presented in more than 100 exhibitions nationally and internationally. For nearly 35 years, Joan was on the faculty of the Visual Studies Workshop, an independent artist-run organization with a graduate program in Rochester, New York, and was director of the Visual Studies Workshop Press, a leading publisher and printer of artist books. There, she played a critical role in supporting and perhaps defining the field of artist books in America. She oversaw the production of more than 450 titles and was editor in 1985 of Artist Books, a critical anthology and source book, thought to be the first such in-depth study of the emerging creative form. Welcome, Joan. Hi, Jessica. Nice to see you. Um, so this is one in a series of interviews we're conducting here at the Ransom Center to highlight some recent acquisitions and in particular acquisitions that represent uh, former gaps in the collection. And we've been working to fill those gaps. We began acquiring your work in 2017, starting with some major works you made in the 1970s. I'd like to talk about those in some depth today, but in order to place them in the greater context of your career and your life, uh, perhaps you could start by telling me about uh, coming of age and training as a young artist in the 1950s and on into the 1960s. Oh, yes, well, in those ancient times, uh, in the 50s, in the world I grew up in, uh, the, the political climate was post-war and fearful. Uh, it was dominated by the McCarthy hearings and Eisenhower personified a fatherly and conservative paternalism. Uh, and art making at that time was governed by discrete media. There was painting, sculpture, printmaking, or photography, uh, everything neatly within its own silo. And there was also an ongoing discussion of whether photography was art. Uh, abstract expressionist paintings uh, swallowing the lingering genres of portrait, landscape, and still life uh, were getting bigger and bigger to accommodate museum walls, or perhaps museum walls were getting bigger and bigger to accommodate abstract expressionist paintings. Uh, anyhow, I loved the painterliness uh, and the energy of that work. Uh, but as a young artist at this time, it was very difficult to see open territory beyond this genre. Uh, Universal, gestural, abstract, monumental, uh, those seem to be the buzzwords of the day, uh, which didn't seem to suit me. The world seemed male. Uh, and that word was incredulously defined by my then college dictionary, uh, the 1948 Webster's Third, as denoting an intensity or superiority of the characteristic qualities of anything, male. Uh, for years, I felt that the personal content that kept creeping uh, into my work made it somehow less. And I worked for probably 15 years before I fully acknowledged um, that I make visual work because that is my mode of understanding. And it proceeds not from the universal and abstract, uh, but from observations of the particular. When you were at art school, did you at first try to conform to those expectations, to those uh, characteristics of universal, abstract, monumental? Uh, I, think, I think I was very fortunate. Uh, I, I went from uh, my childhood and uh, early years in Rochester, New York, in, excuse me, no, in Brooklyn. I grew up in Brooklyn. I had almost never been out of the city in my life until I arrived one day uh, at 
Alfred University in Alfred, New York, which was a town that was one block long, uh, no street lights, more cows than cars, uh, and a tiny little uh, school, and surrounded by woods and mountains and a beautiful landscape. So it couldn't have been more culture shock. And uh, this, this turned out to be a, a really fortuitous and important uh, jolt to my young self. And Alfred uh, was a very unique place. Although its curriculum uh, nominally was divided into you know, painting, printmaking, ceramics, which was very important there, et cetera, uh, it, it wasn't that kind of place. It was small, it was open, uh, everyone knew each other well. And I think that um, a really amazing degree uh, of fluidity was allowed between media. Uh, and also the, the other thing that happened was that there was really nothing to do there but work. So you worked all the time. I remember having a, a minimum of 40 hours of labs and classes in a week. And then sometimes would climb in an open window that a professor had happily left open so one could get back in the evening and work. When you finished art school, did you continue to work in a variety of media? I guess I'm particularly curious about whether or not you were painting or whether you picked up uh, photographic practice right away. What was that sort of uh, transition right after art school? Mm -hmm. uh, well, actually, I, I didn't do any photography in art school. I think I, I had a camera, which I used basically to photograph my other work and had a very hard time processing the, the film and printing it, uh, managed somehow. Uh, after after school, I um, after a brief stint in graduate school that uh, didn't last uh, very long in California, uh, I went back to New York, and uh, at that time, um, I had a series of little graphic design jobs, and was commuting once more from Brooklyn into the city. So. Uh, it, it was hard to do much. I think I tried to paint a little, uh, but the way days are divided with a full-time job and commuting in New York City, I think that was uh, a feeble attempt. Were you able to make paintings or any other larger works once you moved to Rochester in the late 50s? Uh, I moved to Rochester at the end of 1958. Uh, I married Nathan Lyons, who was then working uh, at the George Eastman House. And um, I very soon began to uh, find myself a housewife and a mother. I had a baby in 1960, uh, followed shortly by two others. Uh, there was no help, but fortunately, uh, we had a big house with an unfinished attic that made a wonderful studio. And so through the 60s, uh, I continued painting. I didn't have access to printmaking facilities or to facilities to do ceramics, but I did a lot of uh, painting and drawing. And uh, at this time, there was still the feeling that if you wanted to be an artist, you were supposed to paint on canvas, so I got big canvases and I stretched them and I made some large paintings, uh, abstract mostly that uh, were more or less successful. And uh, through those years, um, I was involved uh, with, with a very good uh, local gallery, the Schumann Gallery. So I was regularly uh, exhibiting work and Jackie Schumann was, was quite wonderful. I didn't realize what a special relationship with the gallery this was. She would say, would you like to have a show, say next May? And I said, sure. And would walk in at the last minute with a group of paintings and drawings and put them up on the wall. Uh, so I continued that practice, uh, you know, doing a lot of 
painting and drawing. Uh, surrounding me was a whole world of photography because uh, my house was kind of uh, an extension of the George Eastman house. Uh, Nathan held photography workshops here and there was a constant stream of photographers, uh, almost all male photographers uh, coming through with work that they talked endlessly about. Uh, I didn't, I don't think I ever brought any work forward to them. I was kind of the fly on the wall that served a lot of coffee and took care of the children. Um, let me see. Yeah, then, then sometime, sometime toward uh, the end of the 60s, uh, I began to feel that it didn't make any sense to be making these big canvases, that uh, they seemed to be made for purposes of exhibition. And other than these local shows, I, I wasn't really, uh, didn't have any hopes or desires really uh, to join whatever commercial art world there was. And so I made a very, like, uh, informed uh, kind of decision to stop painting on canvas. And uh, from then on, I worked mostly on paper. And actually my work on paper was, uh, I felt was much stronger, more immediate and more interesting to me anyhow than uh, the paintings on canvas. Tell me a little bit about the drawings and in particular, how maybe um, doing a bit of collage in some of those drawings may have led to some subsequent practices, either photographic or with fabric, uh, uh, both. Okay, uh, I, I, think, I think you're probably referring to a, a series of drawings that uh, we had discussed that I made at the end of the 60s in 1969. Well, first of all, by the late 60s, uh, the world had changed. So the 60s was a kind of frustrating time for me. Uh, part of me really uh, would have liked to be, you know, the person who went to Alabama and Mississippi with the Freedom Riders. And here I was, uh, or, or participated uh, later in uh, demonstrations in Washington, DC. But instead, here I was a young mother uh, with three children and kind of confined to my immediate environment. Because by the late 60s, the world had changed, you know, the uh, political activism and rage over racism and uh, wars took over the public space as you know and also college campuses and media images uh, saturated the environment and the nature of art uh, too was changing um, its relationship to the political and perceptual world uh, had to be questioned so uh, what had been suitable subjects for art which were representations uh, of the natural world uh, began to be replaced uh, by mediated uh, images. Uh, so, you know, here I was mothering, housewifing, maintaining uh, my studio practice and a modern, modest exhibition schedule really to keep my sanity. Um, and, uh, I began kind of intuitively uh, reaching for issues that were both difficult for me and seemed, uh, you know, perfectly natural. So, uh, okay. So I, I did a lot of drawings and I did some screen printing. Uh, and I think, you know, I'd like to talk specifically about, uh, you know, two, two bodies of work from the, from the late 60s that were kind of important because they were um, kind of, you know, forerunners of most of the work that I would subsequently do. 
And uh, one was a series of, of drawings that I did in the summer of 1969. And um, they were rather automatic and unconscious. Uh, I made a drawing a day for, you know, 30 days or so. There were about 30 drawings in the series. And I say series because that was one thing that was unusual, being surrounded by photography and photographers. Uh, although I didn't use a camera, certain ideas were, were filtering in. And uh, one was that um, I wanted to put images together. I wasn't happy with a single image. I wanted a group of images that related in some specific kind of way. And those images would have uh, certain kinds of, um, you know, themes uh, and symbolic content that repeated and transformed. Um, and also, uh, they weren't very colorful. Most of them were, were black and white uh, with, with some bits of color. So uh, it, was, it was a minimal palette and a very defined uh, range of things uh, that I was working with. Uh, and I felt strongly when I did finally show them that they had a certain specific order, which I don't remember, but at the time, this was important. Uh, and and the, the content was, there was a lot of landscape content, content derived from landscape. There were hearts, there were arrows, not, not that blatantly, but images that related to those things. Uh, there were leaf shapes. In addition to drawing, I really liked uh, the idea of bringing pieces of the real world into my work very directly. So I used rubbing, uh, rubbings and stencils uh, of things that I found or picked up. And uh, I think that when I started using bits of photography in my work, it was that impulse that I wanted uh, something that had, uh, a kind of uh, real, re does that sound strange? Real presence, okay? I wanted a replica of something that was in the world. Uh, and, and in that group of drawings, I think that was the first time that I used any photographic content. And there were just little pieces of Xeroxes because Xerography was, was new, but uh, you, could, you could make little copies of things. And, and, and the Xeroxes that I stuck in there really were pieces from my own photographs. I didn't use things that were found. They were from probably images that I had made of family. So were they representational or kind of pieces of pattern or different graphic elements? What? The, the, little, Xerox, the little Xerox uh, fragments that you inserted. Well, they were bits of photographs, so they were okay. photographic. <laughs> Vaguely photographic, but they, you know, they, they were Xerox, so they had a drawing, drawing quality to them. So they were at home with other mocks made by carbon <laughs> and uh, pencils. What else can I say about those? Uh, well, it might be, we can either um, pick up some threads of that project and carry them forward, or we could also look at another body of work that you made around the same time, if you'd like, because I think they both mm -hmm. might uh, serve as sort of bridge projects to the 70s. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, they were both around 1969. So I'm talking about um, a family album a family album of silkscreen prints. Would you like to tell us about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now about this time, I, I really wanted to do some more printmaking. It'd been a while. I had made, I had done some silkscreen printing right along because you don't need too much technology for that. But I wanted to do some photo silkscreen. And uh, I didn't know much about how to do that because these processes were mysterious. And I had had a, a friend who uh, actually uh, at, at the Institute of Design for a master's thesis in the early 60s had done a screen print 
portfolio uh, with some photo images, which was extraordinary for the time. And I think that she had someone else make the screens. Well, I couldn't find anybody around who knew how to get a photographic image on a screen except uh, a local guy who silk screened license plates. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I went and asked him about this and had this guy kind of chase me around some loft for two hours and finally learned uh, a little bit. I didn't really know how to make graphic arts negatives or positives that you needed for silk screen. So I kind of faked all this and, and made the screens really, uh, you know, in my bathtub, uh, used an enlarger to make some crude negatives. I used some of Nathan's negatives. I also used a lot of uh, found images uh, for this portfolio because I, I wasn't making photographs at the time. Uh, so consequently, uh, the images were fairly crude and uh, that turned out to be a great advantage. Okay, you know, at this point, I think I need to say that almost everything I've done in my life has been um, dictated by the idea of process intersecting the idea that I want to convey. Okay, yeah, say more about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the fact that these photo screens were, were pretty crude and, and not detailed uh, was something that was there and so I used it and, and, uh, <laughs> and made up for with multiple printings and using color in a certain way. Uh, and then the idea of the portfolio was that it would be something about family and it's called a family album. And indeed, you know, a lot of the images are images um, of children. Uh, there are a couple of, um, a kind of, uh, I think, medical uh, illustrations of heads. There's a male and a female one that are standing in for the parents. And these elements kind of uh, repeat and change uh, over the group. Now, this is the first time I had uh, made a portfolio or, or tried to do this kind of extended piece. And so, uh, you know, I'm not sure it works all that well, but suddenly I was excited about the idea of making a portfolio. Um, I was excited about the idea of um, extending this idea of family album and family snapshots into maybe uh, something a little more, something that merged that kind of idea with an art practice. I, and I must say without in any way really being autobiographical, it was <laughs> uh, just an idea about uh, playing with the idea of family images. Okay, I have a couple of follow-up questions. Okay, <laughs> that, that was a lot kind of fast. <laughs> yeah, but you uh, said several interesting things that we can pick up on. Uh, so I might just tell those listening that this was a portfolio of 13 plates mm -hmm. um, published in 69, which I think we've already said. Yes. Um, and in a portfolio case, I believe designed like a, like a, pillowcase, I think you told me. Well, I had never made a portfolio case, so uh, I had done some sewing, so I made a kind of little slip case and slipped some boards into it. <laughs> so it wasn't meant to represent a pillowcase, it was just that. Uh, <laughs> it was what I knew how to do. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, so all right. Well, um, so there's a couple of different questions I have based on what you've just told us. So one is about um, I think we're going to get into with some of your later projects, this idea of autobiography and uh, what it means and doesn't mean to you. But for this particular project, um, I have a copy of kind of a, a, it was a sheet of text you typed up to describe this project. I'm not sure if this was inserted into the portfolio or, or perhaps you prepared it for a discussion or something, but you've shared that with me. 
And um, it, in it, you typed up the following sentence, which I think is uh, very interesting and, and complicated. And, and uh, you, you may have sort of changed your approach over the years, but it says, I have begun to build by addition, multiplication and repetition an autobiographical composite portrait. Um, and so it's interesting that you've just said it was not autobiographical, which I accept, but if we, mm -hmm. I, I wanna kind of ask you what that means in terms of this statement, but then also the idea of a composite portrait, um, portrait of whom, your family, or is it ultimately uh, family members as, of, as extensions of yourself? Is this a self-portrait or would you now kind of uh, thinking about it more in light of the other work you've made, do you no longer think about this uh, in the terms that you wrote in 1969? You know, that's interesting. That was from, that was early, huh? Uh, okay. Well, the question of autobiography is one that I have thought about. And so I think, in, I think that's fair in terms of this portfolio. Uh, but in general, I really am not terribly interested in autobiography uh, from the point of view of memoir or specifics, uh, in, in, not in my, my print work. I, I have done several small books that are definitely, um, you know, come from pieces of my life. And in that sense are autobiographical. And all work, you know, I mean, all work is autobiographical because, you know, work comes from that space where, uh, where the personal intersects the outside world. So, so that's where we are, you know, it's, it's this screen or this scrim uh, where whatever it is you're making art about or whatever you're making kind of jarringly connects and you have to resolve the outside and the inside and, and do something that makes sense to yourself and someone else. Uh, so in that sense, you know, every piece of art making is autobiographical. And, um, and I did use, you know, images, I, well, my children, by the time they were three or four said, you're not photographing me anymore. <laughs> Don't even think you're going to use my image anywhere. Huh. You know, so there's that. But uh, yeah, so this is an interesting question. I mean, that portfolio definitely did have, you know, some images of my children, but they weren't so specific that anyone looking at it say, would say, oh, those are the lion's children, or, or this is, these are the events that this family was involved with. So, so work coming out of your life or the way lives of women evolved in those days, yes. Uh, sp specific um, autobiography and memoir, no. Does that make sense? <laughs> yes, and we're gonna touch on that with a few other projects uh, right. throughout this talk. Um, very briefly is, you've mentioned, I think, that family was one of those topics that was not considered suitable for art when you were in um, art school and just an observer of the art world in the, most of the 60s. So um, could you say a little bit about your decision to go ahead and make a family album? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's hard to realize in this world where selfies predominate. And, and we record ourselves 24 seven, that doing something like a self portrait or a piece that was somewhat autobiographical in the 1960s was an odd thing to do. It, it, it was something that, um, you know, strangely enough, uh, took some courage because that's not what art was supposed to be about. Uh, again, you know, we are still wanting to be, you know, abstract and 
uh, universal, meaning masculine, uh, et cetera. So I was beginning to gravitate to another kind of practice that I didn't you know, quite understand at this time, uh, but you know, I went with it. Uh, you know, and, and I'd also like to say before we get too far off of that topic, so, so these two you know, earlier works, the Silk Screen Portfolio and the Group of Drawings, uh, really gave me a new range of tools. Okay, so I had this idea that in both pieces that what I wanted was not one image, but you know, an extended group of images that made up one piece in both instances. Um, that if I played with print again, I wanted it to have some photographic content. That was very exciting to me. Uh, so, so, the, the, so I was influenced by photography and the way some photographers were working at the time. Uh, but I wasn't, I wasn't picking up a camera and making you know, straight photographic images. It seems like another aspect of being in an environment filled with photographers is that you were, uh, you had a front row seat to great discussion about a lot of things, but um, in particular, I'm thinking about the snapshot. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, what it is, what defines it, why is it important? Why has it been ignored uh, by historians? Uh, what is it supposed to look like? And uh, I think this portfolio, a family album, um, I'd like you to tell me if uh, you were responding in some way to that conversation around the snapshot and mm -hmm. perhaps turning it on its head a bit. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, Nathan Lyons, who I happen to be married to, uh, was a great proponent of, of certain ideas that were kind of emerging in photography at the time. The idea of the sequence, uh, the idea of the snapshot and vernacular photography. Uh, and so, yes, uh, you know, we talk, we understood each other's work. Our work couldn't be more different. Uh, but, you know, there was some dialogue going on. And, uh, you know, so, it, so those were very strong influences in my, in my way. You know, maybe that sequence of drawings, you know, never would have come about and I would be you know, drawing the same way, you know, making a group of things with variations instead of, you know, deliberately uh, trying to, uh, you know, move symbolic, move and change some symbolic content through a series of, of work. Uh, the snapshot, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I also was the one who made all the snapshots of the children. <laughs> so in these two projects that you've talked about, um, in, in each of them, you've spoken about the ways that you were sort of thinking about um, yourself as an artist and as a woman and how you might uh, try to get away from some of those uh, aspects of art that you were told were superior in art school. Um, I'm wondering if we could mention before we move on to the ways that those projects extended into the 70s, if we could talk about another silkscreen project that you did um, using silkscreen and fabric, which is another sort of through line in your work that uh, goes back before this work, but continues after. And that is a work, um, it's, a bedspread and there are some pillowcases mm -hmm. and it's it would seem to today's eyes anyway to have more overtly feminist yeah. uh, themes could you talk a little bit about that and um sort of describe it um in terms of its scale and material but then also talk about the ideas there okay well you know first a little description it it's it's a large you know, a bed size piece, a bedspread. And uh, I sort of got the notion that it would be 
kind of interesting to embed a woman in the bedspread. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of, so, so it, it has this multiple screen prints, again, because it's a screen print, it's kind of abstracted and crude of uh, a kind of cutout almost of a woman lying repeatedly on this pinkish, uh, silkish um, bedspread. And, uh, you know, it, it alludes obviously to a woman being entrapped, you know, in the bed, in the home, uh, immobilized. Uh, it's also a kind of amusing object in a way. Uh, but before I get into that more, I'd like to say that that fabric has always been uh, a kind of, you know, central interest. And uh, I, I sewed all my life. I started sewing clothing when I was a child. And, uh, you know, I kept that up. It was always, you know, something I did, you know, kind of, you know, to relax and also to have clothing. <laughs> Uh, which was of interest to me as a woman. I had a little fabric collection. Uh, the first, this was actually the second quilt I had made. I had made one some years before. And I think I had done that uh, maybe in, in, I think it was in 1960. It was definitely when I was pregnant with my first child. Uh, and I was a little too tired to paint. And I also didn't think it was a good idea to be spraying these noxious paints and chemicals around when I was eight or nine months pregnant. Uh, although I worked in a print shop at the time until the moment I gave birth, so that wasn't so good. Nevertheless, um, because I couldn't paint, I, saw, I made a, a quilt that was really a series of, I think, I don't know how many there were anymore, 16 or 20 uh, small panels. Each one was appliqued and was like a little painting in itself and, and stuck them together. So I had previously made this, this bed size object and that I'm sure, you know, must have been, you know, part of why this idea arose. Sure. Well, tell me more about this bedspread and the okay. uh, accompanying pieces. And the oh, okay, so uh, there was I made the I made this bedspread, this this large bedspread, and then I thought, well, it would be sort of fun to show this as an installation, and uh, I was still showing locally at the Schumann Gallery in Rochester. So to go with it, I think I made a black and white version on a sheet. And I made some pillowcases with the same image. And I think I even made a roll of paper towels. That was a nice, maybe the first of those takeaway ideas that I had. And installed this, uh, you know, on a, on a bed in the gallery in 1969, which, you know, was kind of interesting. <laughs> And I, I remember uh, one response to it, which was that the janitor would not come in and clean in the room. He was very offended by this object. And I, you know, <laughs> and it was, it was rather startling, I think, as an object. It was, it was big and it was bold <laughs> and it was pink. <laughs> and you've said it was a little bit angry. Um, yeah. said today a number of times that it was fun and it is certainly fun uh -huh. yeah I'd like to dig in a little bit if we could you you mentioned entrapment at the beginning could you, yeah. could you just, I, I think there's a deeper level here where you were uh I don't I don't want to put uh words in your mouth of course and, and I'd like you to tell me if this is uh correct or not but um this seems to be starting to think and address some uh critical issues that mm -hmm. maybe aren't so evident in some of the earlier work. And, and there is a powerful force here. Maybe you could. Uh... Oh, oh there's, there's no doubt that it was an angry feminist idea. And I was a pretty angry woman uh, in the 60s. I was, you know, a very young mother. And I was kind of, uh, you know, although I adored my 
children, I felt trapped in this role every day. You know, I had no freedom of movement. I had to, you know, fit in work in the corners. I had to grow up <laughs> while I was raising children. Uh, this, uh, you know, ga gangs of men, male photographers came through footloose and fancy free complaining that they had to work two days a week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they were my responsibility too to take care of because I was the only woman in the room. Uh, so there's no doubt that, uh, yeah, I was, I was pretty pissed through, throughout that period of time and, and when I did this work. So no, it was, uh, no, it wasn't, it wasn't fun really. Well, it was that too. I, I, it was fun to make it. <laughs> was there a community of women in Rochester at the time that you could talk to about this or was it just being expressed through your work? It was just through my work. It, there was none. I mean, strangely enough, I did not have a community of women in Rochester. Um, I really didn't know many women. I really didn't know any people with children, maybe one or two, but I, you know, I was pretty isolated. Uh, so all of this stuff, you know, we didn't have, there may have been kinds of women's consciousness raising groups. There were elsewhere, you know, but not any that I connected with. So I was sort of going through that process, you know, on my own. Uh, right. Okay. Um, you spoke about the janitor's reaction. If if we could, uh, he might have been. He may his his reaction may have represented uh, some other viewers. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Certainly not everyone reacted that way. Is there something you could say about the way it was received then versus when you showed it? Uh, what was it? Almost fifty years later. Um, yeah in Paris and New York just mm -hmm. recently? What, was it received differently? You know, I, I, other than that, I don't remember how it was received. I just don't remember it all, you know. Okay. As I said, that this gallery was wonderful about just letting me do whatever it was I wanted to bring in. So uh, I, I really don't remember. Okay. I mean, <laughs> Oh, sorry. Well, it was 50 years ago. I wouldn't expect it was, you to 50, it was 50 years ago. Yes. 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 Uh, well, I think we. I, I think I think it was received in the recent exhibition as kind of an artifact of the time. I imagine. Huh. So it was no. And again, and again, within the context of a photography, it was shown, uh, you know, at Parry Photo and in a photography gallery. So in the context of a photo, photo fair, I imagine it was also an odd object. <laughs> and perhaps benefited from 50 years of yeah. consciousness about feminism, perhaps. It was easily read as uh, fitting into that discourse, possibly. Right, and 50 years of the photography world loosening up a bit about what she cared to include. <laughs> right. Well, we've outlined a number of themes that were integral to your practice through the 70s and really extended into several different projects. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to talk about those projects. Um, I'd like to invite you to start wherever you'd like, but I'm thinking we should talk about artifacts and prom and go from mm -hmm. there. What would you like to tell us about some of some of the projects you made in the early 1970s? And you can even uh, start elsewhere if you'd like with a book. I, I wanna I wanna let you uh, okay. start. Okay, so artifacts, you know, after the screen print portfolio was my first uh, um, you know, my first attempt to set out to make a portfolio of images. I think so. Maybe I made two or three before I realized I was making a portfolio. Nevertheless, uh, by this time, uh, I'm running an artist press at Visual Studies Workshop, and I have a wonderful uh, array of technology around me. I have a 20 by 24 graphic arts camera and uh, uh, 
a big flatbed offset printing press and the ability, you know, to make negatives and plates and, uh, and I'm doing this in a commercial sense. And then of course, you know, being the way I work, okay, what else can these tools do? You know, how can I use them? Um, and, and at this time, uh, pop art is, is very prevalent. And um, there are people like Warhol making uh, you know, soup cans and, uh, you know, pop portraits and uh, so forth, uh, making art out of um, isolated anonymous objects. And, um, and I thought, well, that's interesting. I mean, if, if I were to choose objects, where would they be? Well, no, they would be objects out of my life, I think. My icons are, are not really, uh, a Brillo box and a soup can, uh, you know, what are my icons? And icons are fabric, all these pieces of fabric that have been integral to my life. Um, and, and this kind of coincided with a really interesting observation that I made. Uh, and in the technology, I have to explain a little bit because I realized that this is all obsolete technology now, but uh, when, you, when you needed to print something in the old days, if you needed to reproduce a photograph, uh, you had to go into a graphic arts wet dark room and you had to make something called uh, a halftone negative. And this was photographing the image uh, through a, a kind of screen that would break the image up into a series of dots of different sizes. And this was called a half tone. So uh, anything that's reproduced in, in, in print still generally, although it's not made in the dark room anymore, is called a half tone negative. And so uh, I made the observation that fabric already has a screen built into it. It has a mesh, it's woven. And uh, what if I just made very careful negatives of this without the halftone screen? And so I tried it and lo and behold, um, I, I got some pretty fine detail in this film. Uh, and, and I must also say that those images, although they're reproducing color, it has nothing to do with uh, printers process color like cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. They're printed in just whatever color I decided I wanted to print them in. And the negatives were not color separations, but, but were just negatives with various exposures so that they differed. And then I could play back with them. So a number of them actually are very, very close to the originals because it just, it just happened that way. Uh, so I had this bit of technology and I had this idea about personal power objects and put them together. And, you know, it's a laborious project. I think I worked for six months on, on that portfolio. Although at this point, they look like something that could pop out of a digital printer. This was not the case. <laughs> well, tell us what some of those personal power objects were and what they had in common and why you... Okay. Well, well, there was the shop rag that I used in my work and the apron that I used to print the rest of the portfolio with. Uh, there was my daughter's, uh, the newspaper bag that she delivered newspapers with when she was 10 years old. Uh, there were you know, random pieces of cloth that had kind of been around for <laughs> years. What else was in there? There was a pillowcase cover, a pillow ticking, pillow ticking, yes. All fabric. All fabric, all fabric, yes, it, it was fabric. Fabric was the idea of it, yeah. So that was both meaningful and also facilitated this new sort of way to use the process that you had discovered. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, so that folio to me was a really wonderful uh, instance in which, you know, the, the, the technical and the idea, uh, you know, came together. That's 
seems to be um, an ongoing occurrence throughout mm -hmm. your work. Um, would you like to follow that path a bit before we talk about the, the, the Xerox portraits? Do you want to talk about prom yeah. as an extension of that or, or any of the books? Uh, that also seem to be yeah, well, we could leave, we could maybe leave, leave the books yeah prom was an extension definitely an extension of that idea so um what is prom Tell, start from the beginning so okay. that people don't uh okay. miss that that prom, prom is a six sheet print uh that replicates a full-size dress when the six prints are hung in dress order. When they're not hung in dress order, uh, they go into a little folder and they get kind of pressed into the page and into the folder. And, uh, and this was a prom dress. So for me, it represents a rite of passage. Um, it, it represents uh, memory in the way that a corsage might be pressed into a book and forgotten. Uh, so it, it's very nostalgic. It's also pastel colors. And <laughs> I'll tell you, this was a very difficult thing for me to do at the time because these still were taboos. I mean, you, you didn't make something that was pretty and pastel and feminine. This was really not feminist. This was feminine. Okay. And so even at that point, although I'd been making, uh, you know, work that was, you know, feminist and, and related to that for some time, this one really was a stretch that I did kind of concern myself about. Uh, what I like about it, it's, it's a small little flowered pattern and it's kind of overall on the same but it has kind of infinite variety in it. Uh, so there are a lot of contradictions in it and a lot of things that, uh, you know, kind, kind of work on, on different levels when you get past the pastelness. Now, now the story of it was kind of interesting too. I had gotten uh, a grant, an actual grant from, uh, what was the CAPS, which was then the New York State uh, Fellowship Program. And I said, fabulous, I finally have enough money to actually, um, you know, take something to a printer that I loved in Toronto. At this point, we didn't, we did not yet have a large enough press to print it on. And I had all the technical know-how from the artifacts portfolio and wanted to do something else and was thinking about, you know, what I might do. <laughs> and in the middle of this, my daughter was getting ready to go to her first prom, the junior prom or something. And she was very unhappy because she was still only like 14 or 15 and she wasn't quite ready for the slinky black dress that was revealing. She was a modest person. She, her favorite attire was flannel shirts buttoned up to the neck. <laughs> and so, I had to stop everything and make this rather ridiculous little flowered dress. <laughs> and again, I was a little angry about this and okay, you know, I'm doing this, but I'd rather be doing something else. And then it occurred to me that, uh, well, <laughs> it's a matter of art and life interfering with each other. So why not let them come together? And so the dress became the piece. Well, and you've spoken so much even today about the frequent convergence of process and idea. And here we see uh, this other convergence of work and right. motherhood essentially being inseparable in some ways. Um, one thing that I, I'd like, that I've noticed, and I wonder if you could comment on if you'd like to, um, you called this dress um, kindly uh, sort of ridiculous, but you've noted that it's pastel and it's got tiny flowers and it's very mm -hmm. modest and it's very sort of sweet and, and could be, could have been 
uh, in someone else's hands, it could have been photographed uh, very romantically. And here we have these very frontal deadpan sort of completely um, unromanticized pieces of it that all form, and it's a grid, which is mm -hmm. um, sort of geometrical or mathematical in its essence. It's not sort of a romantic uh, mm -hmm. rounded form. And um, were you going for that kind of dissonance there or is that a, a happy result of the process or none of the above? Well, it, it's it's both. It's 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 deadpan because it is. I was thinking pressed corsage, uh -huh. uh, and uh, it's it's process because it there's no intermediate. The dress was just stuck in the copy camera, and uh, to make the film in the same way I did the artifacts portfolio, and I wanted it uh, life size, so. And, and I couldn't print it in one piece because I didn't have the means to do so. I don't know whether I would have anyhow. I kind of liked, I, I kind of liked it pieced. I kind of liked this thing which you made by cutting out pieces of a pattern to go back into pieces. I, I like something about that, I must admit. And we own uh, one of these, and it's wonderful. And we've um, shown it here. And when each of the six are framed and hung in a grid, there is inevitably, because museums need to protect their collection and have to frame things. And so there's yeah. inevitably a little space between each mm -hmm. one. And the grid. And so the, the lines don't completely line up and it, it's slightly fragmented yeah. in a really wonderful way. Mm -hmm. um, but just as you were talking about that and how you you sort of like those pieces. I was thinking about how um, some of your subsequent prints, and this is uh, only really tangentially related, but are in very intentionally fragmented layers. So in, in some ways kind of blurring uh, the effect or, or presenting a more sort of jagged picture in some ways intentionally. Um, would you like to talk about I think you probably know the project I'm thinking about, but I'm thinking about the women's portraits mm -hmm. in particular. Would you like to um, go to those next? I think we have a lot to talk about yeah. um, there. I'm very interested in those. And um, maybe this is a, this is a, a project that you uh, worked on for some time, for most of the seventies, as yeah. I understand. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you introduce that project and the, the I'm really interested in, in you describing sort of what it is and what it looks like, but also your uh, what what drove you to make this project? What were you investigating during this sort of long term project? Uh, OK, so at the time I began this work um, in the early 70s, I really would not have been able uh, to articulate ideas about feminism. Uh, you know, nor was I aware of many other women making work with which to begin uh, some kind of redefinition of gender. Uh, and, um, but I felt some need to understand and materialize uh, aspects of representation of women from a women's point of view. Uh, you know, we're all very familiar with art history and all, you know, and the male gaze and the images of women that conventional, you know, images of women. Uh, and images of women by women were solely lacking at that time. We've since discovered a lot of them, but you know, in the early seventies, there just weren't any. So, uh, so this was a very, you know, deliberate project. So again, I'll start by talking about technology because, <laughs> because this is also, you know, looks the way it does because of the technology that was used. So, um, you know, at this time I was introduced to uh, a, even then obsolete music, machine called uh, a halloid Xerox copier, 
Well, this was the original copy machine of the Xerox company or the Halloid company at that point. And it looks nothing like uh, today's copiers. What it was was a two unit thing. And one unit was a big, like a copy camera. It looked like a view camera on a track, you know, a big copy board uh, that made, I think, it'll, you know, eight and a half by 12 image or something. Um, and then uh, it had a holder for a plate, you know, like a, a view camera did, except that uh, instead of taking a, a film, this holder took a specialized uh, selenium coated plate, uh, which is how xerography works. Uh, there's a, an electrical charge, the light neutralizes the charge, uh, on a plate, and then the toner adheres to the charged part of the plate. So in this, in this wonderful machine, there was a camera, and then you put the dark slide into the frame and pulled the plate out and processed it in a separate processing unit. And the result of that processing was a powdered image on, on a plate, which you then transferred to a piece of paper. Well, the size was limited, but uh, luckily after working with that, that way for you know, a year or so, uh, some genius at Xerox uh, helped by figuring out a way to get the electrical charge out of the machine so that you could do a second transfer and transfer it to a larger sheet of paper. Okay, so this is the technology. I have this powdered carbon image that I can transfer to a large sheet of paper. So I can make multiple transfers to a large sheet of paper of this powder stuff. Uh, it, it thrills me in a number of ways because, you know, I've got a background in drawing and I've been dreaming about getting a photo, photographic image on plain paper. And with the artifact series and the prom dress, you know, I got a photographic image on plain paper. Uh, it was very laborious, but it was very exciting because this idea just seemed important to me, you know, to get a photographic image on plain paper. So now not only can I get a photographic image on plain paper, but it's a carbon image. It's the same material as drawing materials. So the combination of drawing and Xerox is, is seamless. Uh, so this is, this is the technology. And, uh, and I must say for at least 10 years, that, that was my main camera. <laughs> I mean, if I'm, if I'm a photographer and I don't know if I'm a photographer or care if I'm a photographer, that was my main camera for you know at least 10 years. I had one in my studio. Uh, okay. So I have this technology and, um, and I have this idea about wanting to find out if, if I'm a woman and I photograph women, what's gonna be different. And then I also have this backlog of historical images in my head. Uh, and also, um, okay, so, I'm reading at the time, uh, very influenced by Eric Neumann's uh, The Great Mother, uh, you know, reading some Freud and some Jung, uh, some mythology. So, you know, all of, all of these, uh, you know, ideas are kind of feeding into this project. Uh, then I guess, when I, you know, okay, so there's a lot of aspects to this. Sure. Okay. Uh, you know, what shall I talk about next? Okay. Uh, so these images, they're portraits, but they're not monolithic because they're not one exposure. They're not even one long exposure. Uh, but an image may be made up of, you know, half a dozen different exposures that are then 
you know, piece together. Again, this idea of stitching and piecing and quilting, I guess, comes into this. Uh, so they don't quite fit. There's, there's an awkwardness. They don't look like a body standing in front of a camera. And, you know, I kind of like this. I like the awkwardness and the, you know, constructed character uh, of them. And it's, so it basically took a day to make one of these images. They were not, they had nothing to do with, you know, instant photography. Uh, they, they were pieced, so there's that. Uh, you know, and, and then there's the images. Okay, so, so a lot of the images are really of me. And, and there are a number of reasons for this. And I don't think that in this particular case, they're autobiographical. Uh, you know, in my practice, I'm used to working alone in my studio. I love working alone in my studio. So occasionally other people, I, I would, occasionally there are other, other people represented in, in the images. I use my mother and my daughter and an occasional friend that I convinced to come up and sp spend, uh, <laughs> you know, several hours in these very awkward positions pressed up against this glass and with these lights and, uh, and you know, very uncomfortable. Uh, so I did some of that. But mostly, you know, I was available. And aside from, okay, in, in terms of photographing yourself, there's something interesting about seeing pictures of yourself and making pictures of yourself. As we see in this world now, everybody is doing it incessantly. And so, you know, there's, there's an aspect of that, but it's certainly, you know, like a, a minor aspect. There are easier ways to take pictures of yourself. <laughs> Um, basically, what I'm thinking is that those self images were performance. You, you know, uh, that I was playing a character. Could you say something about maybe give us a couple examples of characters and maybe you, you spoke about looking at art historical. Mm -hmm and mythological maybe uh, sort of archetypes or, yeah. or characters that women, how they've been represented mm -hmm. by male artists. Mm -hmm. um, could you sort of name or identify some of those characters and maybe talk about? Well, well, okay. So, uh, you know, in, in the prints, it, it's hard for me if I don't see them, but there's one which, you know, was definitely, uh, you know, a Julia Margaret Cameron. And uh, it was it 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 was the you know the kind of I don't know pre-Raphaelite ideal of that period. Um, there's another the one with all the hair is you know I would and they, they're not only specific but you know I would connect that with the devouring mother, who's you know a character out of mythology. Uh, you know, they're not, they're not all that specific. There are several nudes that are different. One is a very frontal straight on, you know, the, the nudes are not romanticized. They're not, uh, they're not beautiful. Uh, th there's one that's based on, uh, you know, standard like kind of pornography shots. She's fragmented and, and kind of, splintering <laughs> into pieces. Uh, so, you know, I think there are, you know, are var various ones that are, you know, and, and so these ideas were more, you know, more or less specific at the time. Uh, well, and I think it's notable that I think it's worth talking about, especially you know, for a project in the '70s, that they were not made by a man, so they weren't made through the male gaze. But they also were not made for the male gaze. You you seem to have made them without any consideration for whether or not they would be, uh, you know, they would meet conventional ideas about what would be flattering or appealing. That was not your concern. 
Well, I, I'm just kind of investigating it. I want to see what it is. I mean, given this process and given those that set of concerns, I want to see what comes out of it. And, and you know, this is interesting. So, so when I showed that, that first series of drawings we talked about, and, and I put that up in a very public uh, space, it was outside a theater, like a, a big theater lobby, got big audiences. And I went to observe, observe a few times and women were really interested in them, even though they were little abstract pictures, women were really interested in them and spent a lot of time looking at them. Men just walked by them, they didn't see them at all. And I noted that, and there was a really interesting review written of that at the time that I don't have a copy of and I'd like to find, but anyhow. Uh, so I, I kind of absorbed that and I thought, oh, you know, this is curious and it's interesting, uh, but maybe I'm a woman talking to women. It's okay. So the, you, your um, understanding of that is that perhaps the actual work was legible as being made by a woman? Or do you think that the exhibition was identified from the door as being by a woman? No. So men mm -hmm. at that moment decided not to take a close no, look? No, no, no. I think it was, there was something about the work that, uh, and mm -hmm. I don't know why, but, but I did make that observation and I thought it was kind of curious and interesting. And so could you say, this is a really nice time to talk about audience a bit. Um, as an observer of the art world and as a former art student and as somebody now, um, now being in the 70s, I mean, uh, you know, watching photography start to change a bit and uh, not just photography, but you're sort of immersed in a variety of uh, media. Um, did you were you aware of an audience? Um, did you, you know, were you thinking about women? Were you aware of who was uh, who you hoped would look at this work? And how, how did that sort of evolve? Yeah, you know, I really don't think I thought about audience very much at all. And I didn't think about audience. Uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of like, one person shows, I didn't, you know, I wasn't thinking a whole lot about audience. I was just making the stuff out of some need to make the stuff. And I think that, you know, because I was involved in a community like Visual Studies Workshop that, uh, you know, my need to communicate, uh, you know, with other artists, you know, on an almost daily basis was satisfied. So maybe that's another reason that I didn't feel uh, you know, totally isolated or that I had to go really looking for community. And I also didn't have time to, you know, spend a lot of time, uh, you know, bringing the work out, out. If someone asked me to send them some stuff for a show, I was happy to do it. But, you know, I still had the three kids. And by this time, you know, in the mid, by the mid seventies, I had a full-time job. And, you know, I continued to make work. So that was, you know, that was pretty full of my time. Certainly. <laughs> Before we uh, get too far away from the women's portraits, I do uh -huh. want to ask you about, um, I don't know if I would use the word culmination, but toward the end of that project, these characters started to um, change somehow. Could you talk a little bit about, um, I, the reason I'm bringing this up is, well, because it's a wonderful project, but also there's one that we've acquired that I think is really remarkable, but um, brings to the project sort of a, a something new to this character. Could you talk about? Yeah, yeah, well, you have one behind you, and that was one of a group of four. I, that, not really, I did four variations on that, and they were kind of called Drawing from the Hip. And I think that, uh, you know, most of the women in that series were fairly, they were fairly suppressed, you know, they were stuck in history or they were, you know, stuck on this piece of paper and they were, they were really objects. They weren't objectified in the same way that maybe male artists would objectify women, but 
uh, but but they were kind of portrait studies. And then these guys sort of, I don't know how it came about, but all of a sudden they got some agency, I think. <laughs> well, and that's evident in the sort of vigorous drawing mm -hmm. that seems to be coming from inside the drawing and not on top yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really wonderful. We're thrilled to have this. Okay. Um, there are many, many places we could take this. I want to pick up on that idea, I think, of agency and maybe um, how that appears in, in some other uh, works that followed. And, and we can even talk about um, how this continued into the 1980s. There seems to be, um, if, if the Women's Portrait Series and some of the other projects were explorations and, and uh, a way of finding your own footing as an artist and a woman and figuring out what that all sort of meant in such interesting times, um, there seems to be some really um, firm statements about how, what you're thinking, where that thinking kind of ended up. And I'm thinking of one that I think is, um, I'm thinking of the 50th birthday print, but if, if you're not ready to go into the 80s yet, is there, it, okay, so so let's look at that one. And you've made a couple different versions of this. Uh, the one we're going to look at is uh, is um, principally cyanotype, and I think it's layered with Van Dyke, is that right? And it's a two, sh two sheets next to one another made from mm -hmm. pinhole cameras, is that right? Um, tell us a little bit about, I, I think we can tell from the title that it was um, in honor of your 50th birthday, but, but uh, <laughs> Tell us about this work and, and, and what, it, what it meant to make this. Uh, well, uh, sometime in the early 80s, I built a 16 by 20 uh, pinhole camera. And, um, and it, had, it was kind of, it had a, I also had a, found a big copy lens. So the way this, lens, this camera was constructed, it had a deeper depth of field than most pinhole cameras. So it was pretty much very conventional, like 19th century optics. Here I am back in the 19th century again, which I was in part with the women's portrait series. And, you know, I seem to be fascinated with this early photography in a way, even though I'm not a photographer still. Anyhow, this was a camera uh, that I made because again, you know, I'm, I'm a printer. And to me, 16 by 20, 20 by 24 is a normal negative size. I work with negatives this size every day. And I made this camera because I thought I could make, again, these direct half tones and put them on a press. Well, I got more interested than that. So I did a very extensive series of mostly landscapes, pinhole landscapes and some portraits that I wound up, you know, not going through the laborious printing offset printing process, but uh, printed as mostly um, Van Dyke brown prints and so forth. Uh, and they were, they're very, it, it's very 19th century optics. They're very, it's a curious body of work, but you know, it sort of fascinated me for quite a while. <coughs> uh, but then, you know, toward the end of that again, you know, I had this camera and it was my 50th birthday and I thought I should do something to celebrate. So, you know, I poured myself a glass of wine and I got in front of this camera for several minutes and made a series of kind of self-portrait, uh, you know, negatives that I, I printed. I printed, I think, a, a number of them. I think I think the National Gallery in Canada has one set of three and uh, so forth. So there must have been, you know, I made a dozen prints or so. Could you talk about um, how you're sitting and other elements of this work that was, uh, what were you saying? What was I saying? <laughs> oh, I was sitting in my garden looking at my camera, you know? <laughs> You know, they're long exposures. I think I might have used the lens, in which case I probably did, because that way the exposures would only be about a minute or a minute and a half. If it was pinhole, they'd be much longer. So what I'm getting at, Joan. Yeah, what are you getting at? What I'm <laughs> reaching at something. You, though, <laughs> is, um, and I know that I haven't uh, invented this 
because uh, you've you've uh, referred to this in other contexts, but um, the way you're sitting is uh, what my grandmother would have said is is not ladylike. And, <laughs> and yeah. I, know, I know that you know that. I'm not trying to apply that to you. Yeah, that's, tr that's fairly delicious. Yes, but I, I think yeah, you did that very intentionally. I've been in the same room with you numerous times <laughs> and you've never sat like that. So it seems to have been something you performed for this particular work. Could you say something about that and, and why you did that on your 50th birthday? Well, I feel by the time a woman is 50, she probably has the right to sit any way she pleases and have a drink and sit with her legs askew like the guy on the subway. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you for that. <laughs> I wanted you to say it. Um, I think that's a really nice place to talk about um, a couple of other more overtly political works you made in the 1980s, um, a few years before this 50th birthday print. But I think we, I, I can see it, it looks like you're, you're directly engaging with um, the politics of the time, specific events. And um, if you'd like to, I'd really like to talk about um, a couple of different projects quickly. Well, it doesn't actually have to be quickly, <laughs> as long as you'd like to. Um, one of them is uh, a project you made uh, documenting, to use that term loosely, um, the, <laughs> a women's encampment in 1983. And I'm gonna let you describe what that women's encampment was and what it was uh, essentially protesting and then uh, the work that you made from that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so th this encampment took place uh, near Seneca Falls, New York, which was the site of the, uh, you know, first women's uh, rights convention. And um, a group of women found out that there's an army base uh, in Seneca Falls or outside of Seneca Falls in Romulus or something. And they found out that this army base was going to be a site to store nuclear weapons that were slated to be then uh, transferred, I think, to Germany. And the military, of course, denied that the weapons were there. They weren't in the practice of announcing that they were storing nuclear weapons in your backyard. Uh, so a group of women bought or rented a farm right next to the army base and uh, started holding protests and marches, uh, you know, protesting uh, the weapons at this depot. And it turned into a really politically charged situation. The townspeople were furious with the women because the, the army base was their livelihood. And so th they put up a lot of flags all over their property as protection against these horrible women. And the women were really maligned. The military uh, was furious. They uh, you know, flew helicopters over the encampment all night. They, uh, uh, it, it, the women were in a fairly dangerous situation just for you know, exercising their right to protest. Uh, and it was, it was a small encampment of women, but on the weekends, a lot of people would come from, you know, surrounding areas, uh, and it got to be like a large group, you know, on the weekends. Uh, and I went down there a number of times. And, and the press was handling it in a very strange way, because even even in, in the press, uh, the women were sort of disruptive. You know, they weren't being nice girls. They were disrupting and, you know, sort of butting in where they shouldn't. I mean, it was a very strange thing. So I decided that I wanted to do, and, and there were a bunch of, you know, radical feminists, blah, blah, you know, the usual kind of thing that went on. And so I wanted to do some kind of piece um, that presented the situation in a different kind of way. And uh, so I don't know how I arrived at, at this. Okay, so the footprints. 
Okay, this is a digression, but I think it's important because uh, it's, it's one of my ideas about photography. Um, and I think it's, it's a reaction to, you know, the men who shoot photographs and uh, take photographs and, you know, all of that. And the photographer's eye, all the rest of it. And it occurred to me early on that uh, my eye is not essential to the photographic process at all. That uh, you're recording something on light sensitive material and your eye doesn't have to be involved with it necessarily. <laughs> and so um, one of the things I started doing, you know, were, were you know, photograms and so forth. So the women's encampment piece, I wanted to do portraits of the women, but uh, by this time I'm becoming interested in um, doing work that has maybe several different materials and points of view within the piece. So the portrait consists of, uh, I, I think they're about, you know, 20 by 24, these pieces of diazo paper, which was a, just a commercial architect's copier kind of paper. And uh, I had the women like stand on the paper so that their footprint is recorded and also the pressure of the foot and so forth. So I was interested in this idea of grounding and of an actual mark, you know, made by the person. And then to the footprints, I added like a little snapshot of the woman and asked her to write some little note about why she's at this encampment. So there are, you know, a, a series of these composite portraits. And then uh, they're kind of framed by enlarged contact sheets that are, uh, you know, actual. Uh, photographs of uh, the protests and uh, the, the things they made that are hanging on the fence, the town, the environment. So, um, you know, so that was the piece and, and yeah, it was overtly political and it was definitely instigated by uh, my support for this uh, action and uh, my dismay at the way the press was handling it. And so uh, I showed this in, uh, a da we had downtown department stores at that time. <laughs> and, and I showed this at Sibley's department store. I think they gave me a wall in a corridor somewhere near the bathrooms, which is great because a lot of people came. But I wanted, I wanted it to be in a very crowded public space. And so, you know, I did show that there. And, and people were very interested in it, I must say. <laughs> well, maybe we can, thank you for telling, telling us about that. I wasn't aware of the full uh, description of that. And, and I'm very interested in, it seems like department stores were a great place to show work. <laughs> it, it, they were sort of a venue often. Yeah, that's uh, where people were. Right, right, right. A lot of traffic. Um, could we also, in this context, talk about notes from the backyard, which was oh. the following year, um, and and if these are connected in in some way? I mean, I'm sure they are. They're both made by you mm -hmm. a year apart. But if we could if we could talk about that and and maybe um, how that came next, describe mm -hmm. that and the and how this was another. Um, you didn't go to a site and make work about a specific event, but how it was linked to a political statement at the time. Yeah, okay, also at this time, you know, also, uh, you know, I, I starting or occasionally made one of these big wall pieces, okay. which were, were grids and, you know, they were kind of related to the idea of books, to the idea of the, ex, you know, an extended frame, you know, multiplicity of things making up one piece. Uh, so Notes from the Backyard was another one, and it was a few years later. 
Uh, and I had done, you know, previously, I had just kind of finished doing this whole group of, you know, lovely 19th century gardens uh, with my pinhole camera. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in gardens. And I think that, you know, symbolically, a garden is a really interesting space. It's part of nature, uh, and yet it's man-made, it's cultivated, and it takes constant work to keep the wildness from encroaching. So it has the human element and the natural element, and it, it you know, you can have lots of fun with it as a metaphor. So sure. we, ha we have a garden. And, um, and it's also sort of a private space, private human space. And um, so the idea of this piece was that the political events of the day are intruding on the private space. Um, so, so the piece is a combination and is most of it is pinhole images and, you know, some of it. So, the outside world is intruding on the private space. So there are images of the garden and then there are images of newspapers of the time uh, with whatever horrendous wars and police actions and uh, you know terrible political events uh, are going on in the world. So, uh, and then there are a couple of you know, photographs of young teenagers. I mean, it's all, so, so it's a complex idea. It's, it's I don't forgot how many prints are in the group. 30, I think. 30, something like that. You know, so it's 30 prints bringing together political events, private space, intrusion. Uh, the, uh, technically it's very, it's very dark and uh, there are very few tones. It's black and white photographically, but it doesn't have many tones. It's very stark and dark. Uh, and okay, so the technical piece, there's always a technical piece that works in with this. So, you know, as a, as a printer, uh, I had like an obsolete box of some kind of um, paper that was meant to make, uh, I don't know, direct positive type reproductions of typography. Like photostat? Oh, like photostat paper. Yeah, exactly. I think it was photostat paper. So I had a box of photostat paper that was direct positive. And I thought, this would be great. I could stick this in a pinhole camera and I get a direct positive, no muss, no fuss. <laughs> but it's, it's very, it's just black and white paper. It's not made to reproduce a lot of tonality and it's made to be processed in a machine. But, you know, it was a box of this stuff and it was free. So I built myself a little pinhole camera in a suitcase you know, that would hold this paper. And uh, most of the images are made in the pinhole camera. There are a few images that are uh, direct reproductions of um, newspapers and so forth that I did make uh, in my uh, graphic arts camera at Visual Studies, so. So were you, um... With that and the women's encampment, and I'm even thinking about books you made like uh, in the 80s, like the gynecologist, they seem to be uh, less a quiet exploration and more of a political, more of a forceful work. Um, is there anything you can say about that transition? Am I seeing that correctly? Or is, that, uh, is there something else going on there? Yeah, I think that, you know, I think that the work I did in the 70s was more, you know, like, you know, a personal, you know, feminist exploration. I mean, that was a time women were just beginning to try and figure out who they were and what their role was. And, uh, you know, the work got, you know, less about that and more about, you know, other things. I mean, and as I go on, uh, and you know, it's funny about political work. I don't know, every so often you just get so, uh, you know, upset and 
about what's going on in the world, that not that making of peace is going to make that much difference, but sometimes you just feel, you know, you have to do that. You have to make some kind of a, you know, a statement. Uh, but a lot of my work became, you know, the, the early work, and especially the women's portrait series, you know, was about representation and how, um, you know, how something has been represented historically. And I got into that uh, more into that idea um, of representation. You know, there was one piece actually called Representations that, uh, you know, looked at paintings in museums. Uh, then, you, you know, and this is later work, you know, followed by a series of landscape uh, images that really were kind of, uh, you know, I got curious about landscapes and representations of landscapes and, and that idea. So, uh, so that, you know, that sort of got to be more of a concern in the 90s and aughts. And so forth. Maybe that's a good time for you to tell us what you're working on now. How, how do, and if any of these threads continue or if you have a uh, different concerns? Uh, well, uh, you know, the landscape piece was, you know, in the 2000s. Um, for the last several years, I've been working on a piece called Domestic Accumulations. And uh, well, I've lived in my house for 60 years. This is sort of odd and collected a lot of, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff here. <laughs> and uh, I decided that I would just like to, like to take a kind of inventory. It's not an inventory, it's not a catalog, but um, I've been photographing just some of the stuff. And uh, the, the overall idea I have, and this is coming together very slowly, the overall idea I have is that I'd like each little group to be maybe uh, seen a different way. So, so far I've done like a group of uh, small pinhole photographs that are of objects or statues or most of them just objects, you know, isol the isolated object again, but in a very different kind of way. Uh, then I did a series of just six, a very careful photo reviewers <laughs> uh, of chairs. Uh, then recently I'm working on um, a group of pictures uh, about Nathan's dark room. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, um, it's gonna be big because the objects are big. So I had to use uh, 16 by 20 paper. So it's kind of fun because it's Carl Kierenz's 45 year old 16 by 20 paper oh. and Nathan's dark room and some outdated chemistry and how all these elements come together. <laughs> I'd like to know. I look forward to seeing that work. Yeah. <laughs> so it's winding up to be another one of those big gridded wall pieces. That's what I'm working on. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see it. Yeah. And um, well, I think I've taken up plenty of your time. You've been very oh, generous yeah. uh, with me today. It seems almost criminal to let you go without uh, an equally long conversation about the books, but we can't talk about all of your work. Right. Um, covered a great deal of territory and certainly yes. um, our audience will know a lot more about uh, the great works we've acquired here, which I am tremendously grateful that we've been able to do that. So thank you, Joan Lyons, for all of the time you spent today um, talking with us about your work. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Jessica. <laughs> Bye, Joan. Bye.